Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our Bible study in the Gospel of Luke. We are picking up in chapter 4, verse 16. Jesus has just gone through the period of his, uh, his, his temptation in the wilderness, and he succeeded. He hasn't given in to any of the three temptations that Satan presented him with. He's completed his 40 days of fasting, and now he's probably uh, gotten something to eat. <laughs> and in this passage, we are going to see Jesus going to Nazareth, which is his hometown. If you want the notes for this study, you can get a hard copy book like I have on Amazon. You can also get them in the link down in the description below as a digital copy. And you can feel free to use those if you're waiting on your book to ship as well. All right, picking up in verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled it. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. So set at liberty, uh, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So after spending some time teaching in the synagogues of Galilee, and we talked about those synagogues at the end of our last video, Jesus went to his hometown, Nazareth. You can see it highlighted there in the notes. Uh, there's the little square up there by the in the region of Galilee. It's up there. Uh, and it was the Sabbath day, right? So all the Jews went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and that's where Jesus went as well. He went there and he stood up, and evidently it was his turn to read something, or he was selected to read something, and he was given the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Now, do I think that was random chance? No, it's <laughs> probably done by uh, the providence of God. But he was given this scroll, and he, he opened it up, and he selected the scripture that he wanted to read. The one that he read is what we know as Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 2. That scripture uh, says this. Let me read it again. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So, sorry, looking around, trying to find the dog that's somewhere around my feet. Uh, so, so that was the prophecy, and Jesus is going to apply that prophecy to himself, and we'll see that. So let's look at these phrases piece by piece of the prophecy. The first one is, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. As we talked about in chapter 4, verse 1, the Holy Spirit was with Jesus and was empowering Jesus. In ancient days, new kings and priests were sometimes anointed with oil as a sign that they, had, that they, they were selected to, to fill a special role. And the Holy Spirit had symbolically anointed Jesus as the Messiah when the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus at his baptism. So it wasn't a physical anointing, you know, with oil, but it was a, it was a symbolic one. You remember the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove and lighted on Jesus, and that was a symbolic anointing. And you might say, well, where do you get that from? And this was kind of a new concept to me as I was comparing this with, this with some verses in uh, the Gospel of Acts. So Acts chapter 10 verse 37 and 38. I believe this is Peter talking here. He says, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed. Notice how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. God didn't pour out oil on Jesus' head, but instead he spoke from heaven, announcing that Jesus was the one that he had sent the, uh, the, uh, the anointed one, the Christ, and he anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so, what, you know, the term Christ, it's, it's not part of Jesus' name, which is the way that we typically use it. We say Jesus Christ. Uh, it's not his last name. The term Christ just means anointed. And if I understand correctly, Christ is kind of the equivalent to the Greek Messiah. I uh, just made a video on that somewhere. Uh, the video was, 
what does the word Christ mean? So go check that out. If I remember, I'll link it either up here uh, in the corner or down in the description. So Christ means anointed. Most kings and priests in the Old Testament, they were anointed by oil, by a representative of God. So for example, King Saul and King David, they were anointed by oil by God's representative, who was the judge Samuel. Well, in this case, God personally anointed Jesus. He was, he was God's special, selected, anointed man to fill the job of being the king of the kingdom of heaven, the king for all time and eternity. Jesus was anointed, Jesus was the anointed one who was sent to, quote, proclaim good news to the poor, as the prophecy said. And there's no doubt that Jesus was an ally to the monetarily poor during his ministry. And even that's reflected in some of God's commands in what he communicated through the gospel, the gospel writers and the epistle writers. But more than that, <clears throat> he came to proclaim good news to those who were spiritually poor, those who were poor in spirit. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, you remember the, one of the Beatitudes? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is for those who recognize their spiritual poverty, who recognize their spiritual bankruptcy, who recognize that nothing that they're going to do is going to be able to get them out of that bankruptcy, and that they're under the condemnation of sin because they've contributed to the evil that's in the world, and that without someone to help them uh, and to redeem them, that there's not going to be any hope for them. Right? So they are, they are destitute without a Savior. That's who the kingdom of God was going to be for. That's why God sent this anointed one. And Jesus, as the Redeemer, uh, who was going to pay the price, that was good news. That was gospel to the world. The next part of the prophecy reads, And he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. This idea is further discussed and, and alluded to by Paul in his letter of 2 Timothy. Paul described those who were in sin as having been taken captive by the devil. As if the, de you know, the devil had tricked them. He had lied to them and, and they had believed his lie. And now they were doing his work and contributing to what he wanted to do. Uh, God said that they must, quote, come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Paul also said that those who were in sin needed to, quote, come to their senses. And Isaiah's prophecy speaks of one who will recover the sense of sight to those who have gone blind. And this is a big theme, especially throughout John's gospel, the idea of the light and and uh, bringing, bringing light and bringing sight to those who are spiritually blind. Jesus is the light in the darkness to give sight to the blind. And those who are, uh, those who are in sin are stuck in darkness, right? They need help seeing. So that's what this, this anointed one of the prophecy was going to help people do. Jesus was going to set free or to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Wait. Oh, yes. Okay. That's the kind of the next phrase. Jesus will set free or set at liberty those who are oppressed. And I thought of an application for our lives from this, and that is that Satan is or doing a really good job at getting us to think that God is the oppressor. He's quite skilled at getting us to believe that God is the one who oppresses us and not him. He tells people that you know, a life without God is a life without all the rules. It's, it's a life of freedom. God's holding you back from real living. That's what the serpent presented to Eve, and that's what she bought into. And in contrast, you know, God tells us that, no, it's not me. You know, I, I, am, I am the one who offers you freedom and liberty, freedom from the oppressor. It's sin and it's Satan that's oppressing you. But how do we know? How do we know who's telling the truth? How do we know who the actual oppressor is? Uh, and I would suggest to you that one of those two, God or Satan, one of those two was willing to put their money where their mouth was. There's, 
there's love in one of the two narratives that we're told. One of those two was willing to make a big self-sacrifice in order to show that he really cared about human freedom and wanted to free people from oppression. Jesus went to the cross to be brutally murdered to set men free. And as evidence that he's the one who's telling the truth, Satan just spews lies from the sideline at no personal expense to himself. You know, anyone can have a narrative. Anyone can tell you that something is true. But the, uh, the proof is in what they're willing to do to uh, follow that truth. Or, you know, people can lie, but a lot of times they're not really willing to make a lot of sacrifices to support that lie if it's going to cost them anything. Uh, you don't usually sacrifice for something that you know is a lie. And... Uh, so when we're evaluating the truth of these two claims, you know, the one who was willing to make the self-sacrifice, the one who showed us that he actually loved us and was willing to suffer to, to extend the love that he wanted to extend to us, you know, that is the one who's telling us the truth. And I think that's a good basis for the evaluation. So self-sacrifice will sift the genuine from the liars. And then the last phrase here, which is quite important, this anointed one was going to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This was a year or a time that was coming sometime in the future when Isaiah prophesied this. There was a year or a time that was coming when God would bless the Jews. And it would be a year of his favor. And that doesn't, I don't think that necessarily needs to be interpreted as a, just a literal year, but just that as a, as a period of time, you know, a, a well, a period of time. <laughs> and that year, or that period of time, began when the Messiah arrived. God had favor on his people, and he sent them the solution to the pro their long-held issue, uh, their, their unresolved problem, and that was the problem of sin and the consequences that it brought on them. In saying this, there might be an allusion here to the year of Jubilee, if you don't know what the year of Jubilee is, that's okay. It was part of God's Old Testament law. You can read about it in Leviticus chapter 25. The year of Jubilee was a special year that occurred every 50 years, and the Jews celebrated it as a time when debts were forgiven and slaves were set free and lands were returned to their original tribal owners. It was a year of celebration, and for the oppressed and the poor, it was a year that they really looked forward to. <clears throat> And so with similar anticipation, the Jews had been waiting for the Messiah to liberate them from their oppression. Now, a lot of the Jews thought that that oppression was Rome, but the reality is Satan was the real oppressor, and that's who the Messiah had come to deal with. And that time had finally arrived. And anyone who was um, feeling the bankruptcy that sin had brought into their lives and was feeling poor in spirit because of their sins, this would have been a year that they had looked forward to for a long time because finally there was a solution to get them out of their situation. So next time we will talk about um, the way that Jesus' hometown countrymen respond to his, his claim, right? Because this is a... Wait, I didn't finish the section that I wanted to finish. Back up. <laughs> That was a good break because a helicopter just flew over. What verse were we in? Oh, okay. I wanted to do 20 and 21 also. What time is it? All right, I want to do 20 and 21 also. So Jesus has just worked through this prophecy and presented this and read it to the people. And, and now, or I'm sorry, he, he's read it to the people and now he's going to explain it. Verse 20 and 21. And he rolled up the scroll, and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. When Jesus had finished his teaching, uh, he went and gave the scroll back to the guy who says the attendant. Apparently somebody managed the scrolls and handing those out. Those were pretty valuable things back in the day. Uh, and then he, he, he sat down. And it says that the audience, that their attention was fixed on him, even after he sat down. 
I kind of pictured this as like, if you've ever been in a church where they do a scripture reading, you know, somebody gets up, they read a scripture, and then they sit down and the service moves on to something else. I figured Jesus had kind of wrapped up his section, and so he went and sat down, and, and that's, that was all that there was to it. But that's actually not what was going on here, because it was actually customary for the teacher to sit before explaining the text that they just read. So this explains why the congregation's attention was all fixed on him even after he had gone to his seat, because they were expecting an explanation about the text that he just read. And I, this is a really good point when it comes to Bible interpretation, because we need to be careful that we are not interpreting ancient actions through a modern lens. At least we need to do the research into the ancient customs to make sure that they match kind of what we are thinking they mean. It can be dangerous to interpret ancient, ancient actions through our modern customs because they're not always the same. Very rarely in our culture does somebody sit when they intend to teach. They almost always stand. You know, if you go to a, a seminar, the teacher stands. If you go to a church building, the teacher usually stands if they're preaching or uh, teaching. Teachers in a classroom, all the students sit and the teacher stands, right? And so uh, it's, it's odd for us to think about, but understanding the ancient culture that their teachers always sat helps us to understand this a little bit, a little better, and it keeps us from, well, and, and, and doing the study about that ancient custom keeps us from misinterpreting this text or getting bad ideas mixed into our, our study uh, just because we, we aren't familiar with that world. Okay. Maybe that was a little redundant. <laughs> so the people's attention was all fixed on Jesus. They were waiting for his explanation. And he told them that Isaiah's words were going to be fulfilled that same day. And he said, what is the actual quote? Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So whoever this anointed one is, he has come and you better prepare yourself for the fulfillment of these words. Now, there may have been more to Jesus' teaching that just isn't recorded here, but if you know the Gospels and the Bible story, you'll, you'll be able to understand Jesus' meaning just from that one phrase. He's claiming to be that one anointed, that Christ, that Messiah. Now, now we can finally close, and in the next section, we are going to talk about how Jesus' countrymen respond to this claim. You know, are they all for it? Are they opposed to it? Do they think he's lying? Do they think he's a crazy person who doesn't know what he's talking about? That's what we'll talk about next. And so until then, hope you guys have a great day, and I'll see you next time.